What are some keys to victory for the Baltimore Ravens as they prepare to take on the Kansas City Chiefs in the AFC Championship game? All that and more coming up next here on Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, coming to you from the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for being here and making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every single day. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes in video form on YouTube, where you can subscribe, like the video, and audio form wherever you get your shows, so you can follow along over there as well. Today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make everyone more right now. New customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Five days a week here on Locked on Ravens plus bonus content, of course, and it's a big week for the Ravens. So we are churning out that content on Locked on Ravens with analysis, updates, game previews, and so much more as the Ravens prepare to take on the Chiefs in the AFC Championship game. The support has been awesome that we've had on this channel all channels, video form, audio form, even social media, subtext has been awesome. So be sure to tell a friend, tell a family member about this show as we also do live shows after the game as, as well as after Ravens Big News. So we have a very special episode here today. Just Rebecca the Athletic joins us for our first two segments as we talk about some Ravens keys, the victory, some game flow, a little bit about the Ravens in general with their leadership. So Jeff and I have a lot to talk about here, and I will round out the final segment just talking about some more keys and some housekeeping notes with some coaching hires. It seems more and more likely with every passing day that Mike McDonald and Todd Munkin don't get hired, that those two might stay. Also, I mentioned it on the Ryan Merkin show, so it's out there. I might as well mention it here too. It is my Geno Stone year today. It is my birthday, 26 on the 26, or I guess you'd call it my Matt Elam year, which I, I like Geno Stone year better, or DeWan Landry, if you want to put it that way. So uh, I mentioned it on the Ryan Merkin show. I figured I'd mention it here too, because I think it's kind of funny that the Matt Elam, the Matt, I thought of the Matt Elam thing before the show, and I'm like, you know what? I might as well say it. So just a little something there. But without any further ado, let's now get into our conversation with Jeff Zrebeck. Joining me now is Jeff Zrebeck, the senior staff writer for The Athletic, covering the Baltimore Ravens. Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time. And I feel like it's poetic here for the Ravens. It's their first AFC championship they're hosting. And they get to do it against the defending champs and a team which we know, Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes, they faced off four times in their first four years. The last time they played was 2021. Lamar got the better Mahomes in that matchup, but now they have a chance to go to the Super Bowl and they get to go through what I think a lot of people called Lamar's kryptonite early in his career. Yeah, you know, it almost feels like one of those situations where this is how it should be. Um, you know, the Chiefs have been kind of the gold standard in recent years in the AFC. Um, you know, when the Ravens, you know, in 2019 started kind of, you know, their ascent with Lamar as the quarterback, you just knew they were going to have to get through the Chiefs uh, to get to where they want to go. And, um, you know, it, it's this year has not always been it, it's been rocky at times for Kansas City. Um, I know there's a lot of people that kind of counted them out. They haven't looked great. It's a different Kansas City team where they're, you know, their defense is really good. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes. But, you know, his numbers aren't what they've been in past years. But they've gotten better, like, you know, Andy Reid coach teams tend to do in their clutch, and and here they are. And I, it just feels like one of those things that this is how it should be. The Ravens want to be, you know, the you know at the top of the conference, you know, at the top of the mountaintop there, at the AFC mountaintop. And, uh, you know, you should have to knock off the team that's been there, uh, and that's the Chiefs. And uh, here we go. The Ravens have an opportunity to do that Sunday. Yeah, it's exciting. And I know Patrick Mahomes is no stranger to Asian Championship games. This is six yeah. straight for him. Now, this is Lamar's first, but I think there were a lot of narratives that he and the Ravens quieted on Saturday against the Texans in terms of rest versus rust in the 2019. Ravens were talked about a lot here. But when you talk about Chiefs versus Ravens and Lamar versus Mahomes, there are a couple of areas where the Ravens possibly could get the better of the Chiefs. And you talk about how good the Chiefs defense has been this season. 
one area where the Ravens have succeeded on offense where the Chiefs haven't as much on defense is in the run game, where we saw against Buffalo on Sunday, James Cook kind of ran up and down that defense for the first three quarters. And Baltimore's run game, even after losing J.K. Dobbins and losing Keaton Mitchell, you still have quality playmakers like Gus Edwards, Justice Lee, even a Dalvin Cook. How would you expect Baltimore to split up their carries knowing that maybe Dalvin potentially could have a bigger role based off what he saw on Saturday? Yeah, I think um, what's interesting, I mean, the, especially like shotgun runs, the Chiefs have really struggled to stop. And and the Ravens have done that really well, obviously, for a number of years now. Um, I think at this point of, you know, we've seen enough. Uh, we haven't seen a ton of Cook, but we've seen enough with how Todd Munkin sort of deploys running backs with the rotation uh, to know that he's going to go with the hot hand. But, I, I mean, look. Justice Hill is the most dynamic guy they got in the backfield. And this is a conference championship game. He does a lot of things well, you know, out of the backfield, pass pro, running the ball. He's run the ball between the tackles better than I think he has in the past. Um, I think we'll see a lot of him depending on how the game goes. Um, obviously, short yardage, uh, red zone. You know, I I think you expect to see Gus Edwards more and and – you know, Dalvin Cook now has another week of practice under his belt. Um, you know, so I think you could see a little more of him. Um, last week, he kind of didn't get his first carry until the game was pretty much decided. And, and you know, that's understandable. I mean, a lot of stuff the Ravens do at the mesh point with their run game and, and some of the plays, and you know, that, that takes some. And you have to have a lot of faith in a guy, you know, especially if you're concerned. Turnovers in the playoffs kill you. So, um, I, I think this is a, a Justice Hill kind of game with with uh, Gus Edwards, you know, short yardage and, and different at mixing in at different points. And uh, we'll see if Dalvin Cook can get in the mix. But I think it's become pretty clear uh, that Justice Hill right now is their best option in the backfield. I agree with you 100%. And I think Keaton Mitchell was so great for them. Yeah. Justice Hill did nothing to lose a role. It was just Keaton no. was that good for them that it ended up working out that way. But I also think, Jeff, with the way this team is locked in right now, especially Lamar, you hear about the leadership that Lamar has had this year, Roquan as well, leading the, most of those pregame huddles. Based off of your time covering the Ravens, have you seen a team, especially in the Lamar era, this locked in and, and focused on one goal at, at this level? No, I really haven't. I mean, you know, look, the last two years, Lamar wasn't even around at this time. He, I'm not even – I'm just saying even late in the right. season. Like, he was injured and then – um you know, 2019, I, I think, it. you know, that was a fun team. And I just don't think they knew, you know, like they were just dump trucking people every week. And it was just like, I don't even think that team under realized that they could lose a game, which is why, you know, they just beat everybody in front of them. And everything went so well that year. And I, I kind of, you know, I kind of think this year there's just a little more of a perspective. They, they, you know, the leadership is a little more defined in a lot of ways. Like who is the leaders on both sides of the ball? We know that. I mean, I'm not saying those past teams lacked for leadership. I, I just think this year it's a little more defined and it's a little more mature in terms of the mindset of the team, the leadership of the team. And, uh, you know, people get sick of talking around here about past playoff failures, but you almost need to go through that in a lot of ways. I mean, this is it's not easy to win. It's not easy to get to the Super Bowl. Um, and I think uh, with some of the scar tissue over the years, with some, you know, with 2019, even 2020, you know, I think guys learned a lot from that experience. So, um, you know, and I think that explains partly why Lamar Jackson has been how Lamar Jackson has been lately. He gets it. You know, these opportunities don't come around too often and you have to make the most of them. And I think this team has really maturely handled uh, this season in a lot of ways and not just the playoffs, like traveling to London and being out there for a week and all the West coast trips and some time off down the stretch. I, you know, I really think this team has been very businesslike mature and just focused on that week, which, you know, sets it apart a little bit from past recent Ravens teams. Yeah, and that 2019 team was really young too. That was Lamar's second season, first full year as a starter. And you're right. I a hundred percent agree too, where going through those failures as a younger team, you remember that and you go back to those experiences when you're in a situation like this. And 
they had, I think, maybe three close wins that season. That Steelers game after they made, went through all those changes, the 49ers game and the Bills game that year were all close, good wins. Yeah. But you're right, they were blowing out teams 40 to 10 or 59 to 10. There weren't necessarily a ton of places where you could say, well, where were they tested? There were a yeah. few. But this year, going through that stretch after the bye, the Rams game was a character win. I think they have a lot more under their belt this year, which I think gives me a lot of confidence. We're going to have more with Jeff coming up in the second part of the show as we dive into more keys to victory, more Ravens talk, and a lot more coming up next year on Lockdown Ravens. First, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. And sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially as someone who's unbiased on your life. So today I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking the same thing this week. And honestly, same thing as last week a little bit, where the Ravens and Chiefs, they get that three o'clock spot. I would rather have them in the later game. I think, you know, a quote unquote prime time, give Baltimore that game, Baltimore, Kansas City. I think, I don't know. It feels to me like that's going to be the better game than San Francisco, Detroit. So I personally would give the Ravens that prime time spot. Best team in the league going up against the defending champs. I know it's not necessarily an 820 game that is prime time this week, but I would still give the Ravens a later slot there. But Therapy can be different for everyone, and most of us have bigger problems in our favorite sports teams, and it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The NFL regular season is all wrapped up now. We're deep into the playoffs, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. It's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is super easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explorers app. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and so much more. So for this Ravens and Chiefs game, Maybe you want to put together a shot. Bateman, anytime touchdown. Justice Hill, anytime touchdown. Maybe you want to pick the Ravens out right. You can definitely do that over on FanDuel. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bit of layup. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. We're back. Our second segment, Locked on Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still talking with you here. And we're now going to dive right back into our conversation with Jeff Rebeck. Plenty of more Ravens content to dive into now. Jeff, when you talk about defending Lamar Jackson, I guess for a defensive coordinator, it keeps you up at night because he can beat you in so many different ways. I think we saw against Houston on Saturday where if they didn't spy him and they dropped that linebacker back, you saw Lamar take off up the middle and take advantage of that. And then when they did, obviously, the second half adjustments that Munkin made, that Lamar made, he just diced that defense up. If you're Kansas City, what what do you tell your defense in terms of how you defend a guy like this? Yeah, you know, I, I think, again, when you talk about past Ravens teams, I think that's the big difference between this team. That's what makes them most dangerous. It, it, you know, that 2019 team, and, you know, I know – um you know, ESPN's Dan Orlovsky has said this, but it felt like they only had like kind of one lane to beat a team, right? I mean, and not to say they couldn't make plays in the past game. Lamar Jackson led, you know, led the NFL in touchdown passes that year, but everything was so predicated on that run game. And, and when it got stopped or slowed down that that team was in trouble, I think what makes this team so special is, you know, we've seen we've seen them win in a variety of ways. I mean, throwing five touchdown passes, rushing for over 200 yards in the second half uh, against Houston when something wasn't working in the first half and they weren't really responding. They kind of went to the quick game to get going and then they leaned back on the run game when they need to put the game away. And I think that's the difference. And I think, you know. I don't think you could sit back against Lamar Jackson and just wait. I, I I do think you need to take the fight to him in a lot of ways. Now, that doesn't mean blitz every play. I know what a Texans blitz on like 75% of his dropbacks, which is kind of insane. But um, I think you need to bring guys at him. I think you need to be aggressive. Um, and I think you need to try to, you know, give him some looks that maybe he hasn't seen and, and kind of test how well he's seen the field and how patient he's willing to be. I thought last week was a really big step for Lamar Jackson in that way, in that, yeah, he was frustrated. Yeah. You know, they had the three straight drives. I forgot if they're all in the second quarter, but the crux of them were in the second quarter. They had the three straight three and outs where they headed into halftime, you know, tied. 
And, you know, I think to make adjustments and to completely change the way he played in the second half and what they were doing, and they did that on the fly, I think that was a huge step to kind of fight through a little adversity, make the adjustments, figure it out, and then blow the other team off the field. And and in a lot of ways, I think they needed that a little bit. They needed that test. They needed to kind of, you know, be put on their heels a little bit in a game, in a playoff game with those stakes, and then see how they reacted. And they reacted really well. I don't think they can afford as slow of a start as they had last week offensively. I mean, you don't want to, you know. They're going to need to score more than 10 points, I, I would think, in the first half. But we'll see how that goes. But, yeah, I, I just think you have to come – you have you can't sit there and wait and be passive and just wait for Lamar to kind of do something to beat you. Yeah, I think you, you have to take the fight to him in a lot of ways while mixing aggressiveness with deception and, and some different looks that uh, maybe, you know, he's probably seen it all at this point, but maybe some stuff he hasn't seen often. Right, and – I think another difference, and you kind of talked about it, Jeff, is the weapons that Lamar surrounded with this season as opposed to maybe previous years where they go out there and they get them guys like Zay Flowers and Odell Beckham. Yeah. You already have players waiting like Rashad Bateman. But the one conversation is with Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely. After Mark goes down, Isaiah Likely comes in and just takes off. And with Mark seemingly returning this weekend, all things look towards that way. We'll see if it actually is that way come Sunday. There's been a lot of conversation about, well, where would Andrews be reinserted? What does the offense look like? And I mean, look, Mark Andrews is still, in my opinion, your best pass catcher. He and Lamar Jackson have that connection with each other that can't be replicated. But the way Isaiah likely is playing is hard to justify taking him off the field. So would you expect more two tight end looks? Would you expect Andrews to be on more of a pitch count and he doesn't play as big a role as some people are anticipating? What's kind of your read on how they would handle having both Andrews and likely the way that likely stepped up? Yeah, I think you said it great. I expect both. I mean, I, you know, you can't expect Mark Andrews after being out as long as he's been out to play 80% of the snaps or more. Right. You just, I just don't think that a, I don't think he's suited to do that uh, with where he is. Like, does he look better this week in practice than he even did last week? And I think last week he all surprised us how good he looked. Yes, he, he did. I mean, we only got a limited glimpse yesterday just because of how, how you know, the, the rules about how much practice we can watch. But he looked good again, and, and he looked better than he did last week. Uh, and I would be surprised if he doesn't play. But we're not talking about 100% here. He's not going to be 100%. He's not going to be 100% probably till July when they when they have reconvened for training camp, whenever that this ends. So, um, you know, it's just can he play well enough to help you out? What I've seen, I believe he can. Um, and I, him ha having him on the field, I think, is just another threat, which is important in games like this. Um, but, yeah, you can't limit Isaiah Likely too much. I mean, it can't be either or. It, it needs to be – both and, and in a lot of ways that uh, you know I, I think Mark Andrews may even become a complimentary guy here rather than being a lead dog I, I can't you know in the red zone on third downs I mean I said this yesterday Kevin I, I, I introducing Lamar ja uh, excuse me Mark Andrews out of that tunnel Sunday uh, the jolt that that's going to give I mean yeah I mean there's a lot of you know star power down there in pregame and, and all that and I think it's going to be a madhouse but I, I you know that ovation for Andrews could be deafening um, so you know I think he's going to have a role I think they'll get him in in spots but uh, I don't think you're looking where anywhere close to a full complement of players and 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 about the whole thing and I totally agree. I, I, the one silver lining of not having Mark Andrews was I think it sort of encouraged – I don't want to say forced. It's probably too strong of a word. But it sort of encouraged Lamar to look elsewhere um, and, you know, develop trust into other guys. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff was always unscripted. He did some of the stuff, some street ball stuff with Mark Andrews, and he trusted him. That's all well and good, but he clearly trusts Isaiah Likely. I mean, that throw against Houston in the end zone was a clear sign of trust that his guy was going to come down to it. And Isaiah Likely is developed, and, you know, it's important you get flowers, keep flowers in the mix, and obviously Odell Beckham and, and you know, and Bateman. And, I, you know, that that's the good part about it. But, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're talking about a complementary role here for Mark Andrews, and, and, and that's just fine. Uh, you know, the, they, they have plenty of guys to catch the football now. I mean, I think we've all seen that. Yeah, much different team than years past. And yep. even if Andrews is out there, 
I don't want to use the word decoy because I don't think it would necessarily be that. But if, if he doesn't have necessarily as big of a role, you still have to respect him when he's on the field because of what he can do, even if he's not at 100%. And another big thing, Jeff, I think is the coaching battle between John Harbaugh and Andy Reid. Obviously, very well documented the relationship those two have and how they've worked together in the NFL. But the, the evolution of John Harbaugh as a coach has been a big storyline here, considering where he, what, what his style was when he first came into the NFL head coaching world versus where it is now. I mean, talking to a couple former Ravens, you know, I don't think that would ever happen in their locker room or in the earlier John Harbaugh days. In your time covering the team, what has the evolution of John Harbaugh looked like? And I guess, were you surprised once this dancing started hmm. with him that it was actually happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, I've seen John, I, you know, I've I started covering the team during the 2011 season. So I wasn't here from the very beginning of John Harbaugh, but I've covered most of it, you know, you know, so, um, and, you know, you sort of see him evolve and, 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 um, be a little more out there with his players, but, you know, dancing is kind of taking it to a new <laughs> level and that's just not, you know, like, I mean, that's not really old man, old white man dancing either. I mean, he's getting into it. I mean, he's pulling out the moves. And I mean, look, let's give George Gotzi his credit too, Kevin. I mean, that was some, that was an impressive oh, yeah. set of moves to get things kickstarted <laughs> there. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that bothers me now, um, and I get into it with people on Twitter all the time about it, cause it's a, it's ridiculous and it's a joke narrative. This whole thing that Harbaugh doesn't accept alpha males and wants everybody in his locker room, not saying anything publicly, being boring, doing whatever John Harbaugh says. This this locker room is filled with nothing but alpha males and always has. I mean, people talk about this purge after 2012 of, you know, a lot of their outspoken vets, a lot of those guys that were responsible for the mutiny uh, that that happened during that season. Right. And, you know, you look at those cases individual. Yes. John Harbaugh and Bernard Pollard did not like each other. I, OK, that's fine. But they didn't get rid of Anquan Bolden because Anquan Bolden questioned authority. I mean, John pushed to keep him. They just didn't feel like they had the salary cap space to do it. And they felt like his number, his his cap number was going to outweigh his production. And Anquan proved them wrong. That was one of the bigger mistakes they've made. Carrie Williams, you know, they knew he was going to get overpaid in free agency. Uh, Ed, Re you know, Ray Lewis and Ed Reed weren't John Harbaugh pushouts. You know, they just felt like it was uh, Ed uh, Ray retired. And they just felt like it was time for it. Uh, for Ed. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, right down the list from Eric Weddle to Steve Smith to Mike Wallace to Roquan Smith, Damian Clowney, they bring in big personality guys all the time. And I think that's where Harbaugh has really kind of, um, you know, evolved a lot of ways. I, I mean, I, you know, I think when he first got here, he had to set his territory. That was a locker room that wanted Rex Ryan. He was a kind of a, a little known special teams coach from Philadelphia. They wanted their boombastic defensive coordinator as a head coach. That was a defensive team. And, um, you know, he had to be like that in a lot of ways. He had to be re rigid. He had to kind of set his, you know, dig, dig in on some things and fight for what he thought was important. But I think over the years, we've seen him relax on a lot of stuff. And, you know, one by one, veterans seem to want to re seem to want to sign here. And it isn't because of the money, because they wind up getting a lot of guys on the cheap that they probably shouldn't get. So that that says that speaks very highly to John Harbaugh. Yeah, even a guy like Steve Smith Sr., he he is yeah. he has his strong personality, and mm -hmm. he just told a story recently about how he respects John Harbaugh, loves John Harbaugh. So I agree with you, Jeff, where coaching styles change, but I don't think it's been a question of John Harbaugh never accepting or never listening to his players. I think it's something he does really well. But to get you out of here, Jeff, I want to hear your thoughts on the matchup in general with Kansas City. You talked about it early about how it's, you know, maybe a bit of a different Chiefs team in terms of not the explosive offense we've been used to when the Tyreek Hills were there. And this is Baltimore's first AFC championship game. Well, the Ravens, Baltimore's first since 1971. To round it out, too, how, how cool is this for the city where the Orioles go on their run and, of course, the playoffs don't end the way that they want, but to have the Orioles and the Ravens kind of doing their thing here and for the Ravens to host this first AFC championship game, what has it kind of been like to take in the energy of the city right now. 
Uh, I mean, it's awesome. I mean, this is yeah, this isn't about me. Let me make that clear. But this is why you do it. I mean, as a reporter, you want to be covering the big event and to have it in, in the city where you've worked for a long time. That that makes it even more special. And I mean, look, I you saw on the sideline on Saturday, you know, you know, you Peyton Manning there and Carmelo Anthony and Rudy Gay and one former Raven after the other. I mean, there's a lot more guys down there than I, I even recognized because it was so cold and everyone was so bundled up with hoods and hats. You couldn't even really tell all the guys that were down there. But I've talked to a couple former Ravens uh, this week doing stories and, and they plan on being here. I mean, it is going to be a madhouse. I think it's great for the city. Um, I think it's great for the franchise. I mean, all those years – what was one of Steve Bashotti's big complaints? It's well, we need to be at home. We need to get some home playoff games. You know, it's great that we were able to go into Denver and win and go into New England and win, but that's not a way to make a living. I mean, that's tough. That's tough sledding. I mean, the Chiefs have shown how important over the years home field advantage is. So uh, it, it's great for the city. And, and you know, it just it's exciting. I mean, it's just been you kind of. You kind of coast and ride the energy, and, and and it makes it very easy to do your job because of the excitement. You know, I, I mean, I, I got a I, I got a close to six year old at home, and he came home from school yesterday and he said, "Daddy," and he was telling me all those friends and classmates that had Lamar jerseys on, and <laughs> you know, he doesn't, you know, he knows a couple of the players, but he doesn't follow it that closely. He's just not, you know, he's still so young, but I mean, even he's experiencing it at school and he's in kindergarten. And, and I mean, that's, and that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, and, and, and the love of Lamar Jackson in this city, how he's kind of become developed into the face of the city sporting landscape, the face of the city sporting landscape. I mean, it's great. I mean, this is the way it should be, man. I mean, if if you can't get excited about this, I, I mean, I don't I don't really know what to tell you. Yeah, the city is ecstatic right now. I know there's a bunch of nervous energy, but yeah. we're going to see how it plans out for them. Sunday, 3 p.m. M&T Bank Stadium against the Chiefs. Jeff, I appreciate your time. Please tell people where they can find you and what you're working on here is, again, exciting time in Baltimore. Yeah, um, at The Athletic, we have all sorts of good deals going on now. I think I saw the 50 cents per week or whatever it was. I mean, you'll always find a deal, uh, you know, and I'm working actually on a, on a Zay Flowers story now, sort of uh, how he's broken, you know, the the narrative of that the Ravens can't draft and develop receivers. And, uh, you know, I talked to Mark Clayton last night and Torrey Smith this week about it and still trying to get in touch with a couple of those other guys. Not not to kick them, some of those guys, while they're down, you know, and say why, you know, but just to talk about the pressure that comes with being a first round receiver in Baltimore. I mean, there's a lot of baggage that comes in that role and, and how Zay has responded to it has been tremendous. Um, and obviously, I'll have more of a game preview over the weekend. It, it, you know, it's going to be. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know, I can't I can't recall. I, it was my first full year on the beat when they won the Super Bowl. And and Kevin, I, I you know, I'll be first to admit, I barely knew what I was doing. I was a young reporter and you, you just don't know how fleeting those opportunities can be. So uh, to cover this year and, and them extending the playoff run and have an AFC title game at home. It, it's been kind of cool just to see how everybody has reacted and, and to kind of look forward to the matchup. Jeff was so great. It was wonderful talk. Talking with him provided so much great Ravens insight, and I'm really glad we got the opportunity to talk to him and get his perspective on the team, especially being so close to them and having been so close to them. So he's seen some things in that Baltimore locker room. He's seen these, this team kind of transition into where they are now. And so, again, Jeff was wonderful to talk to. Really glad we can get him on the show. Coming up in the final part of the show, I'll be taking it through it, talking about some more keys to the game and keys to victory for the Ravens. Also, again, some housekeeping on the head coaching vacancies, which are very quickly starting to get taken up. Stay tuned, a lot to get to on Locked on Ravens. First, this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. And Prize Picks, if you're looking for daily fantasy sports, look no further than Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the most fun so many have had, doing up to 25 times their money this football season. All you have to do is select two or more players, pick more or less in the projected stats, and place your entry. With the basketball season here, you cannot pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League. The league ready specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, LeBron James and Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo with three pointers made plus receptions. If you want to play along with some of Price Picks' favorite players like Raffer Meatman, like Meat and Andrew Schultz, you cannot find the community plays under the promos tab of the apps. We went to some of the biggest names of the Price Picks community each week. And Price Picks offers a really awesome reboot policy. So your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games. 
If you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player is rebooted. PrizePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Go to PrizePix.com slash LockerNFL. Use code LockerNFL4 for first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's PrizePix.com slash LockerNFL. Use code LockerNFL4 for first deposit match up to $100. PrizePix, daily fantasy sports made easy. We're back. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still talking with you here as the Ravens and Chiefs gear up to play in the AFC Championship game Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Really appreciate you making some time out of your day to listen to me here on Locked On Ravens. Or maybe I'm in the flow of your day. Maybe you're working a little bit, listening to me while I work. Really appreciate anybody listening from anywhere means the world to me. We just hit 6,000 subscribers on YouTube a couple days ago. The growth has been incredible this week. People are excited about this Ravens team, and I'm very, very excited that I can talk about this team with how good they're playing, and hopefully we have a couple more weeks to talk about them if they win the safety championship game and they head to the Super Bowl. So be sure to subscribe, video form, audio form. It helps out a ton. You can hit the like button on YouTube. It helps put the show on YouTube in front of more Ravens fans. Also, you can share it with a friend or a family member, both in video form or in audio form as well let's get into some more keys to victory first and then we'll dive into some we'll kind of do a sandwich here we'll do a AFC championship sandwich with keys to victory coaching updates and then we'll do some predictions as we head into the weekend for this game I think for Baltimore and stuff that Jeff and I talked about as well the Ravens running game getting off to a fast start how do the Chiefs defend Lamar and can Lamar take advantage of the looks that he gets I think we saw him adjust and, and it wasn't just Todd Munkin and Mike McDonald that adjusted at halftime right Lamar said it was him who talked at halftime it was him who gave, gave that passionate speech an inappropriate speech according to him said some things that he could not say to uh reporters because it would not be family friendly but that's what it's going to be where if the Ravens have to go into this game and you know they maybe struggle early and the Chiefs get out to a fast start this is a different team than Houston Houston's a young team and when they punched in the mouth at the end of that first half, Baltimore punched back and Houston fell down and did not get back up. The Chiefs can get punched in the mouth and they can come back. They've been there. They've done that. You have to respect what the Chiefs have done, what Patrick Mahomes has done. But you're talking about the best team in the NFL right now. It is the Baltimore Ravens. The, the best quarterback in the league right now, it is Lamar Jackson. This is the team to beat. The champs are the champs. You got to respect they're the champs. You got to go through the champs to be the champs. Lamar said it. A lot of other people have said it, and I'm saying it right now too. But you just got to play your game. Mistake-free football, turnover-free football, your defense if you're Baltimore going and getting a couple turnovers themselves. That, to me, those things are all things that I think Baltimore can hopefully do against Kansas City. It can make Kansas City's offense one-dimensional. All these different things we've talked about throughout the week, whether it was with Jeff today or just on our earlier episodes, Everything we've talked about all culminates into one, and I'm really excited to watch this team play. First AFC Championship game in Baltimore since 1971, the first in Ravens franchise history. Now, a couple of coaching notes. We all know that Mike McDonald and Todd Munkin have been hot coaching candidates in terms of interviews, but we now know for Friday, at least for today's show here on Friday, that only two coaching spots are remain the Washington commanders and the Seattle Seahawks. There were, there've been a bunch of head coaching opportunities snatched up over these last couple of days. Obviously Jim Harbaugh late on Wednesday night, got that job with that team in Los Angeles. And I think that again, Justin Herbert now has a good coach. And I, I, again, I was not very high on Brandon Staley and I've been very vocal about that, but then you have Raheem Morris going to Atlanta and you also have Dave Canales going to the Panthers. So I think for Mike McDonald and Todd Munkin, two openings left. I would assume Ben Johnson gets one of them, whether it is Washington or Seattle. And then that leaves maybe one of the, I call them the big three, Bo Belichick, Mike Vrabel, Pete Carroll, those veteran coaches. Do one of those guys take the other job? Do they all take a year off? At the very least, I think the Ravens will be keeping one of their coordinators, if not both. Now, nothing is obviously set in stone until we actually get all the openings filled. But it's looking a lot better than it was maybe a week ago that the Ravens will be able to keep both Mike McDonald and Todd Munkin around, which is great. Whether they win the Super Bowl or not this season, both of those guys have been so instrumental. Mike McDonald over his two years and Todd Munkin over his one of turning this Ravens team into the perennial top dog, the top contender that they've wanted to be now really ever since Lamar Jackson 
came into the NFL. Now, let's get into a couple of predictions. Again, we'll be back here tomorrow with another bonus episode of the show. We'll be doing a bonus episode both tomorrow, and then we'll do a pregame bonus episode on Sunday to get everybody excited for the game. I, I did it last week. People seem to really like it. So we'll be doing that again. But some early, I get, well, it's not really early anymore because the game's in only a couple days now. But some predictions before the other streams that we're going to do or other shows we're going to do this weekend. I do think Baltimore wins this game. You know, I've predicted it all week. Baltimore has done, and I'll say what I've said for the past, really, it's been about a month now. Baltimore has done nothing to show me that I should pick against them. They've been the best team in the NFL. They have found their rhythm on offense. Their defense has been lights out all season. What have they done to have me pick against them? Kansas City is a good team. Their defense is great. Their offense, and this is the playoffs, right? Anything can happen in a one-game playoff series. You have a bad game if you're the Ravens, you're probably eliminated. You can still win if you have a bad game. We've seen the Ravens not play up to their standard and still win football games. But if you lose, if something goes wrong, you can't make it up next week. There is no next week. This is the playoffs. So the pressure, it's going to be high for both teams. Now Mahomes and, and Kelsey and Reed and everybody on that Kansas City team has been there, done that. Maybe it won't affect them as much because it's been there. But maybe it won't affect them as much because they've been there. But in my opinion... All the, all the conversations have been, well, Lamar is going to be under so much pressure and Lamar is going to feel all this pressure. Lamar is so locked in right now and this team is so locked in right now. I understand that, again, Mahomes has been there. Mahomes has the accolades, but that doesn't guarantee that Lamar is all of a sudden going to feel this crushing pressure because there have been pressure moments for him this year. Now, admittedly, not to the level of this, right? I think this is a different animal, but he's handled pretty much every pressure situation this year pretty well, right? I mean, even the Texans game, there was pressure there, struggled early, but came back with a vengeance and won that game by 24 points. So I'm confident in this Ravens team. Again, I feel like it's really since the middle part of the season or early middle part is setting up to be their season, knock on wood, not trying to jinx anything, obviously, but it's not that I don't respect Kansas City because I do, but Baltimore is playing like the best team in the league right now. And, and you have to respect that fact as well. That's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in again. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Also subscribe and follow along in audio form. We'll be right back here tomorrow talking Ravens football with a bonus weekend episode. So be sure to stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.